Uh, I actually have in my notes, don't get emotional on the first line. It's just so good to see you all this morning. One year ago, from Holy Saturday into Easter Sunday, we prayed for 24 hours straight. A prayer captain introduced a topic at the top of the hour, and that prayer captain committed to pray for that entire hour. We prayed for a vaccine to be developed. We prayed for the people of God to persist. We prayed for our neighbors to persist. We prayed for all manner of things. And then after that 24 hours of prayer, we capped it off with a virtual gathering, where in our homes we sang, we received God's word together, yet separately, worshiping Jesus, the risen Lord. And I'm so thankful that on this morning, April 4th, 2021, we can gather here at the levee with old friends and new friends to celebrate the day that changed all days and worship the one who conquered the grave. The mere fact of this day, my friend, is an answer to prayer. Even in days of pandemic and turmoil, there is resurrection hope. As I said at the very beginning, my name is Mason. I'm the lead pastor here at Res. Our church is just a block or two that way. Uh, This is a sort of transitioning week. Most of our folks have been online for the better part of a year. We've been spread out in little pods all across our theater, seated in worship. Next week, when we go into our theater, we'll keep masking up, we'll keep distancing, we'll make two changes. We'll stand for worship, and if you're staying home, we invite you to stand in your homes. And the second thing we'll do is begin retaking the Lord's Supper weekly. Like The Lord's Supper, historically, is a centerpiece of Christian worship, and we want to return it to that place in our worship. Now, this morning, I just want to preach the message of the resurrection, a message of faith for doubters, of hope for the hopeless, and life for the spiritually dead. Now, throughout the sermon, I'm going to be looking at this side of the fellowship more than this side, because the wind is blowing this way, and so you get more crackles, less crackles than I'm facing this way. So, I'm not preaching at you directly, I just don't want this and that to disturb me as much. We'll consider this morning the resurrection event through the lens of a disciple who I think is a good bit like us, Thomas. Or maybe you've heard him as Doubting Thomas. Now, as you'll soon see, I think this nickname is a bit unfair. I think we've been a bit too hard on Thomas. I mean, how do you respond to news that is simply too good to be true? How do you respond to news that just doesn't make any sense? My aim for the next 15, 20 minutes is that we would believe in Jesus whom this morning we cannot see. That we may be blessed in our believing and that we may have life in his name. May our hearts here on the banks of the old canal behold the risen king. And may our hearts respond with Thomas in worship and allegiance. My Lord and my God. The title of this sermon is My Lord and My God. Our text is John chapter 20. Verses 24 through 29, which I will read now. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So our text this morning begins, now Thomas, one of the twelve, called twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So before we dive into this passage, it's worth reflecting briefly on what exactly Thomas had missed. I mean, if there's anything you don't want to miss, it would be exactly what Thomas missed. As I read in our scripture reading during our singing time, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Jesus had been laid there. Long story short, Jesus is not there. She thinks someone's stolen him. She thinks this guy talking to her is the gardener. It turns out to be Jesus. And he says, go and tell the disciples. Fast forward. Mary gets to the disciples. I have seen the Lord. He's not dead. He's alive. 
just like he said. And here as we sit this morning, fast forward 2,000 years, we are links in that unbroken chain of gospel witness from the lips of Mary Magdalene. These words from Mary have crossed time and space and they show no signs of stopping. Locked away and hiding, the disciples are hearing these words from Mary and they're pondering them, they're deliberating whether or not they're true. And that very evening, Jesus came to his own. Jesus to a little group of disciples locked away in safe hiding says peace be with you as the father has sent me so I am sending you receive the Holy Spirit preach the gospel and you will bring with you the forgiveness of sins this Jesus this Jesus he's risen this is hope after heartbreak this is joy after grief this is life after death the band is getting back together but not the whole band which leads us to our passage this morning. Now the scriptures don't really tell us where Thomas was. The scriptures don't really tell us the mood he left in. But it's not too hard to piece it together. With a few exceptions, namely some very courageous women. The disciples were sent scrambling for their own lives. They were guilty by association and they had to ride out this season of religious, political, and social turmoil. They had to do the first century version of deleting their account and going somewhere that no one could find. Thomas, if we're honest, has probably completely given up. I mean, can you blame him? How do you respond to news that's too good to be true? I mean, y'all remember movie pass. $10 a month. As many movies as you want to see for 10 bucks a month. I remember thinking, there's no way that's going to work. And guess what? It didn't work. But the Ballards sure took advantage of that thing. <laughs> wow, they had it. I mean, much more seriously, we've all been to funerals where someone we love has died like, we wouldn't subject ourselves to even thinking it's possible that they're going to stand up and walk. I mean, we wouldn't want to put ourselves to that emotional turmoil. It's over. We have to make peace with the reality that is and not wish for a reality that we wish were real. We like to pretend ancient people were stupid, and they weren't. But even in the ancient days, dead people had a tendency to stay dead. Dead people didn't just come back to life, not in this century and not in the first century. Doubting Thomas is part of our cultural vernacular, but doesn't that seem a little harsh? I mean, Peter, the great apostle Peter, he denied Jesus three times in one night. And ain't nobody calling Peter denying Peter. If he must have a nickname, I think Practical Thomas might be better than Doubting Thomas. Oh, you've seen Jesus. Correct me if I'm wrong, but literally everyone in this city saw what happened. It's all the news is covering if there were news in that first century. From the moment he rode into town the week before he died to the moment that he died, all anyone in this city could talk about was this Messiah figure. What do you stand What's your opinion on him? That was the conversation around the dinner table. Everyone saw him come to town. Everyone saw him die. I'm not a moron. I'm not stupid. It's over, my man. We lost. I got, I got to think Thomas is thinking, man, our very presence in this city is a threat to our lives. I bought this all once. I believe he was different. I was willing at one point to die with him, but I can't do this again. I can't get hurt again. Thomas says in verse 25, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Thomas says, I need some good, hard evidence if I'm ever going to believe something like that. 
Don't miss this. Practical Thomas has exactly one thing going for him. And that's that Jesus loved him. Look with me in verses 26 to 29. Eight days later, so a full week. So we got a full week later. The disciples are inside again. And this time Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. A week later, the disciples are inside, gathered together again. This time Thomas is with them. The doors are still locked because things are still crazy. But if you've not learned that locks aren't stopping Jesus by now, then I don't know exactly what to tell you. Jesus comes into the room. He stands among them and he says, peace be with you. And where does Jesus' attention go? It goes right to Thomas. Because my friend, Jesus is always drawn to the margins. Jesus always looks where you or I would not look. Jesus is always moving towards doubt and not away from doubt. Jesus is always moving towards those who don't believe, not away from those who don't believe. Jesus is always moving towards tax collectors and prostitutes and not away from them. Now, if you'll remember, Jesus was not physically present when Thomas said he had to touch his scars to believe. But my friend, Jesus knows the questions that your heart is asking. And Jesus, in a moment of resurrection power, looks right at Thomas. Put your finger here and see my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Thomas, don't disbelieve. Thomas, believe. Oh, before Thomas now is a new world of giddying possibility. This has actually happened. Jesus stands before him, not metaphorically risen, but truly risen. Not risen outside of history, but risen as the culmination of history. Not risen a scientifically, but risen as part of creation's new order. And with that, one of my favorite scholars says, Thomas takes a deep breath and brings history and faith together in a rush with these words, my Lord and my God. From Thomas lives to the sight of Jesus is one of the most clear and beautiful Christological statements in the New Testament. Jesus, my Lord and my God. When Thomas comes face to face with Jesus, he comes face to face with the reality that this man is no mere teacher. He's no mere movement maker. He is no mere philosopher. This man is God himself. Now, Jesus lovingly prods a little bit with Thomas. He says, do you believe because you have seen? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet still believe. Here in these moments, a week after his resurrection, Jesus foreshadows that right now you guys believe. But there will be a day that comes where this message is preached throughout the whole world and many more who have not seen will believe. Blessed are the hundreds of millions of people who will believe this message, who did not see these scars. Blessed are the men, women, boys and girls who hear the news of resurrection and who respond in repentance and faith. Blessed are all who hear the gospel message and respond, Jesus, my Lord and my God. In fact, the whole letter of John, and if you're here and you're new to the faith or you're contemplating Christianity, you're not convinced yet, we love you, you're in a safe place, I would encourage you to find someone who's following Jesus and read through the Gospel of John. Because John says this whole Gospel is written so that those who have not seen Jesus may believe in Jesus. In verses 30 and 31 he says, Jesus did a lot of other things in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. 
But they are written, these are written, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, or the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you might have life in his name. My friend, Jesus pursued Thomas in his doubts, and he pursues you in yours. What we have in the pages of scripture is not a fanciful account of some hopeful revolutionaries or a highly redacted version of an event that never happened. What we have in these pages is the true historic testimony of Jesus living, dying, and rising from the dead. The resurrection we celebrate this morning, as N.T. Wright says, is a is not simply a highly peculiar event within the present world, though it is that as well. The resurrection is principally the defining event of the new world, a world that's being born with Jesus. Worship team, you guys can come on up to the stage. My friend, what you do with the resurrection determines everything about your religion and your life. To believe in the resurrection is to confess with Thomas that Jesus is Lord and Jesus is God. And by believing in his name, John says, we may have life. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus has come to earth to bring life and life to the full. He has defeated sin in his death and vanquished death in his rising. The hope of the nations and the promise of a new world, even here in the madness of this one, is found on a bloody Roman cross and in an empty Roman tomb. So come, my practical friend, with all of your doubts like practical Thomas. This morning here at this beautiful, sunny, a little bit windy outdoor service, look to Jesus. Look to Jesus, the Son of God, who with the Father and the Spirit is the creator of all. Look to Jesus, my friend. Who created you? He knows you intimately. He knows the number of hairs on your head. And he knows the number of days in your life. He knows your hurts and he knows your pain. He knows the thing you don't want anyone else to know. He knows what makes you smile and he knows what makes you cry. He knows the best moments of your life. He knows the best moments that lie ahead. He knows the worst moments of your life. And he knows the worst moments that lie ahead. He knows all of your doubts, all of your fears, all of your secrets, and all of your sins. And just like he pursued Thomas, he pursues you. He already blessed the disciples, man. He already gave them this commission. He didn't have to come back. He could have said, if you don't roll with me, then you don't roll with me. If you're not going to trust me, don't trust me. If you're not going to listen to Mary Magdalene, then don't listen to me. But he didn't do that. Because he loved Thomas. He loves practical Thomas. He loves doubting Thomas. He loves rejecting Peter. He loves failure Matthew. He loves all of these people. And he was not content to leave a single one of them behind. And just like a week later, Jesus came back for Thomas. In the word that is recorded, Jesus is making his appeal to you. Blessed are those, Thomas, who believe what they've seen. And blessed are those, Thomas, who have not seen what you've seen, who still believe. Your name, friend, is written in those scars that Thomas saw. By those scars you are healed. The punishment the prophet says that brought us peace. 
was lovingly laid upon him. Jesus who created you. Jesus who knows you. The Jesus who pursues you. Pursued you, the Bible says, even to the end. On Good Friday, Jesus died for you. He bore your sin, your shame, your guilt, your dark season, your wayward days. Even your good days he had to die for because those good days themselves were never good enough. The Jesus pursued you, pursued you to the end. And this Jesus, this Jesus who loved you with his dying breath, has risen from the dead. And because this Jesus is alive, we can, no, we must believe that he is exactly who he said he was. All of eternity hinges on the question, is the resurrection true? Because if it's not, we can pack it up, we can sell off the stuff, because it's over, it's done, we have no hope. But if the resurrection is true, we can celebrate, we can sing, we can worship, we will eat, drink, and be merry today, for yesterday we were dead. Because he is alive, we can, nay, we must believe that he is exactly who we say he is. With Thomas this morning, may our hearts cry out, my Lord and my God, come, behold a world of resurrection. Let's sing together.